We're live. Say good morning, my lady. Good We've, morning. Good morning. Happy Monday, everybody. We are kind of a hot mess today, huh? We got the uh, wet hair, don't care kind of a day going. Now, I'm leading into a theme here. Not quite Thanksgiving, although we're there. Um, I'm leading into a theme. I have to show you good morning, everybody. And I'm going to catch up with the thread and everybody who's here and see how the weekends were. But I just want to show you as a bit of foreshadowing. Today's the first day they officially went all remote with school, so it's crazy. Um, do you all recognize this piece of couture as an ugly sweater? I mean, it's so ugly. Good morning. We're going to say good morning to all our buddies, but I'm going to release you in a minute and just model it a little bit. This was our homemade ugly sweater from um, this past year, right? You won a competition last year with this? Yeah. Okay, so if you go over there for a minute, I'll call you back after I say good morning to everyone. Okay. All right? And if your school comes out in the meantime... We'll have to just hold my, my hold that in our memories. All right. See if you can see if you can uh, skive for a little while. Good morning, everybody. We got a lot going on this morning. Good morning, Anita. Your stuff is off. I hope that yarn gets there quick. Love being here and learning. Yeah, we've got some fun learning to do today. You know, I feel like we have been neglecting Pearl and lots to say on that subject. But we're, this is going to be an almost all Pearl week. Oh, I've got to get that Zoom call up too. Uh, good morning, Crystal. Oh, tied a rope to the little one on our walk to school this morning that she wouldn't blow away. Is it that windy? Oh, my gosh. Donna, good morning from Alberta. Good morning, Joelle. We missed you on Friday. It happens, though. You lose track of time and life and everything. Uh, luckily, it's recorded. So I'm sure I'm sure we saw you later. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, Penny. It is chilly. Huh? It's super bleak day here today. I think my mom's on here too. I think I saw her little face pop up. Good morning, Linda B. Good morning, Renee. I haven't seen you for ages. Agree with you, Anita. Oh, that is so nice. I'm sorry. I'm a. I am really a hot mess today, and there's no reason for it, particularly. Just uh, Monday crazies, I guess. Good morning, April, Amber. Doreen, good morning, Kira. There you are from Plymouth taking an early lunch to sneak this in. You know, Kira, I always wonder if 1130 is the best time or if I should push it back half an hour so that, let, give me some feedback on that. Is 12 better in general? Do, do, do a lot of people feel that you have to like rush your lunch hour or, or a sneak or something? Because if so, we could always push back a half hour. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that. Good morning, mom. There you are in Granby, Crystal, Amanda, Linda H., Beverly, good morning. Hey, Tad, you're there too. We sent some funny stuff back and forth the other day. I was super enjoying that. Um, Bordondo, oh, hello from Spain. That's exciting. Good, mo Welcome. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning, Carol. Okay, great. Everybody's, everybody's on. That is, it's good to see you all. Um, what a weekend it's been. So let me catch up on a few things. Any time in the morning is good for you. Okay, good, Anita. Let me know if anybody is really struggling with 1130. The only reason I did 1130 at an odd time was because I thought uh, if I did it at 12, it's not so much a coffee time as a lunch time. And I didn't know, I mean, I know we're only talking about Eastern Standard Time, but I didn't know if like uh, stylistically that was a huge faux pas, if coffee was meant to be a morning, a morning retreat thing. We'll see. I defer to those who work. Yeah, I do too. So anything's fine with me. Now, I want to remind you, um, on Wednesday, I'm going to put the information out. I'm going to say it again here, and I'm going to put the information out this morning for the Zoom call on Wednesday in the Facebook group. If you're a Facebook person, uh, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club, I'm going to put it up in there. If you want to Zoom, as we're going to Zoom as a group on Wednesday instead of coffee time. It's going to be in place of coffee time at the same time. So we can see each other, Zoom, we can hook something while we chat, answer some questions, catch up, connect, figure out who's where. Uh, and if it works well, we can do this weekly because I think doing something interactive is great and can work. I don't see why it shouldn't work. Um, and just to just in case you are as computer challenged as I am, it will mean if you zoom and you put your camera on, it will mean that I can see you and other people can see you. Um, but do not be thinking that you don't want to do it because your house is a mess or you've got, you know, the messiest stuff behind. It's impossible. The only reason I'm showing you this tiny two foot square corner is it's because it's the only corner that's not a huge, crazy mess of the house. So don't be thinking things like that. We would love to see your face regardless of everything else going on. It's crazy times for everybody right now. So I'll put that information on Facebook 
And if you are not on Facebook and you didn't uh, see the cocktail time on Friday and you would like to participate in Zoom and be live with us, I'm not going to ask you questions and put anybody on the spot. Of course, I'm not going to do that. You can ask questions. You can chat with each other. Um, I can take a back seat. If you all are chatting, that's great too. Uh, so if you want to participate and you're not on Facebook to, to get the information that way, then email me at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. And I will send you this big zoom. They always give you this giant paragraph of zoom information. Um, I guess it's all important, but uh, it's a lot. And there's really only one link in there that you click on and uh, we can make it work. You know, I'm not going to do 15 minutes of, uh, can you hear me now, but we'll figure out how to make it work and we'll get better and better at it as time goes on. So this morning, uh, this weekend, I also introduced one of the classes. I've got a bunch of classes coming up. I'm going to introduce a beginner's class either later today or tomorrow, a true beginner's class. Um, I introduced a dying uh, class uh, on Facebook. So I'm going to let everybody know about that. That's not on Facebook. It's going to be a dying class. I can give you the details. If you are not on Facebook, I can send you the details. Email me at ribbancandyhooking.com. I set it for Sunday, December 13th, Eastern St Standard Time, 6 to 9 p.m. Might run over, who knows. Uh, but the class, is it's like a holiday-themed dyeing class, which doesn't mean you're going to end up with a bunch of red and green wool and yarn. It's just a theme to have fun. You know, I was playing with the idea of holiday foods and giving myself some ideas of things we could dye based on holiday foods like um, you're going to get four skeins of yarn, complete skeins of the three ply uh, Briggs and Little yarn, and also four fat quarters. So in other words, a yard, but they're already going to be cut for you of door glitter yarn. It's not super intensive glitter. It's not super blingy, but I thought it was something different and nice for the holidays and the you know new year. Uh, so we're going to be doing colors called peppermint bark, fruitcake, mulled wine, marzipan pig, gingerbread man, spiked eggnog, Turkish delight, and plum pudding. So it's going to be a real mix of colors. We're going to do a lot of different techniques. Uh, we're going to do a little casserole. We're going to do uh, pan dyeing, sort of dip dyeing, ombre dyeing, sausage roll, a lot of different techniques. So a lot of things in a short time. And the class, I've made the class as low as I could in terms of price. It's $165 plus shipping. And your class comes with all of your dyes that we're going to use for these things. It comes with your full yard of fabric divided into four for four quarters, uh, your four skeins of yarn, tons of little spray bottles. You know, you're going to get spray bottles little jars with little Tiffany blue lids that have some dye colors in it. You're gonna get little pouches of dye. I, I ordered um, bulk of everything. That's how I was able to offer it so low. I ordered bulk. Um, little mini spoons like that you would use in a restaurant, tiny little wooden spoons because you know those metal uh, measures are quite expensive. And if you love dyeing, maybe you get those in the end. But for now, these little wooden spoons are going to work great for all intents and purposes with us. So it's there's going to be a lot of little things in your kit, a lot of little things in your kit. And the only thing that you're going to need if you're doing this dyeing class is um, one or more, however you want, right? Because you don't have to go like full blast and keep up with everything. I'm going to record it so you can look back on it. But um, I would pick up like from Goodwill or a thrift store or somewhere cheap, like a casserole dish, at least one, if you have two, even better, and a pan because your stuff has to be designated stuff or you will poison yourself. So you don't want to do that, of course. Um, although around the holidays, it is tempting, I know, but don't do that. Get a designated casserole dish and a pan. And if you can get a couple of each, even better, you can be working on four um, surfaces if you've got four burners. If you're working in a space where you don't have burners, think about getting like a Facebook marketplace or somewhere cheap used. They sell them cheaply too. Um, like little Bunsen burners, they make them so cheap now that you can get some heat going if you don't want to be in the hub of things while you're doing the class. But it's going to be a super fun class. And we will do a lot of dying classes. And I want to keep them all between 150 and 200. Because I know there's lots of classes to choose from out there that are in the many hundreds. But at the end of the day, when you learn how to casserole dye, when you learn how to sausage roll dye, when you learn how to dip dye, you're done, right? You have the technique in your head, you've written it down, and then it's just a matter of practicing and choosing different colors every time that suit you the best. Um, but it's supposed, to, it should be super fun. So that is happening this weekend. Now, the reason um, I had Jocelyn model that horrific, ugly sweater was because of an, a design that's coming out um, later today as a kit. I got thinking about, you know, the holidays and how this one, um, Okay, morning is good for you. That's great because it's 5.30 p.m. Yep, you're way ahead of us. I'm um, so great. Good feedback. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, 
I've been thinking about holiday parties and how they're just not happening this year, or I hope they're not happening this year. Um, it's a sad loss, but it is what it is. And, you know, in our family, we always have a lot of crazy traditions every year. And I have this ongoing uh, sort of battle to the death with my sister on holiday bling. It seems like a sort of benign thing, a jolly, cheerful thing to do, but we really are serious about our bling. And every year we have secret bling that does not appear uh, because we celebrate Christmas um, until it's under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. We don't see the other person's bling, but we have to assume that ours is better. And there is no formal sort of face off, but we both do. She's an artist and I, artist of sorts, not as good of an artist as she is. She's like a fine art painter at Yale, but um, we do our bling and it's different each year. And one year I have to say, I really won the battle of the bling by dressing the entire family in the ugliest, ugly sweaters any anybody has ever imagined. I mean, with my costume degree, this is where all that money went was into these sweaters. The kids were tiny then, so I have them boxed up somewhere and I have put on so much weight, I wouldn't fit in mine even though it was a gigantic sweatshirt. I wouldn't fit in mine unless you somehow deflated me before Christmas. But um, which would be so nice. But um, anyway, it was a wonderful, fun time. And on every gift, besides the sweaters to be, you know, just intimidating, uh, on every gift I had made like a bread dough ornament of an ugly sweater and decorated each one differently and super ugly. And that's how we have celebrated in the past with ugly sweaters because we are we're not really office people with office parties and ugly sweater parties. But um, the idea kind of came about to make a kit for rug hooking of an ugly sweater. And not only that, a kit that will come with ugly sweater colors to hook your sweater um, and tons of crazy bling that only you can decide on the placement of the bling, how much is too much, where the ugly, where the ugliness begins and the sort of tolerated beauty ends. Um, that will all be up to you. But I've been working on my ugly sweater this weekend and I'm not done. I pulled it, all, I pulled it out many, many times. I've only got half of it done. Um, but I've got like a black and white, like a black watch plaid. This is the background. I started hooking a background, so don't be confused by this. I've got a stripy sweater uh, sleeve going, and I'm not sure I'm even happy with that, but I've got ho ho in gold. So that's gold lame fabric. Um, I've, I haven't finished the snow on my tree yet. I had to, I had to stop to shower, but I've got uh, some bling going here. I'm not sure it's enough. I doubt it is. And then a good old swag, <laughs> hey, Kira, a good old swag uh, going on the edge, you know, very 80s style. If uh, heavy metal musicians uh, became involved with ugly sweaters, this might be the one that they would go for. So I need to think more in this. I think it needs to become more ugly. But again, my threshold for ugly is different than yours. But it's an opportunity, I think, to do a funny sweater. Your kit will come with a lot of material. Um to, do, to make choices. And it will also come with a page of stencils. So you're, you can either choose, this will be on the website later, you can either choose this full size sweater like the one I'm doing, because I'm probably in the at the end of the day gonna frame it. I was thinking about either, this is a turtleneck style I did too. I'm either gonna frame it or I'm gonna um, back it and make a garland of them for under the mantle, like arm to arm, you know, just like maybe four or five of them, maybe one for each family member, including the dog and the cat. Um, you know, a garland under where this before the stockings get hung uh, with these larger ones. So your choice will be either to order a large one or to order three small ones, which will be more this size. And these you could turn into ornaments. So, you know, turning them into ornaments is fine. It's I've done videos before on, you know, I, this is going to be on monk's cloth. Um, it's linen will unfray too easily, even if I zigzag around it. But these will be a set of three if you want to make them as ornaments. So you'll have the choice between one big one or three small ones. And you'll have a ton of supplies in your kit for both. And it'll be kind of a mystery thing. I'm going to go back to the craft store again and get some more bling, different kinds of yarn, different metallic stuff. Um, let me just show you this first. Your your sweater will come with a lot of guidelines like, do you want it as a vest? Do you want to have cut off lines? Do you want a V-neck, a turtleneck? Do you want a stripey uh, like I had on mine? Uh, I had ho-ho here. Did you want a medallion? And then there will be a page on a piece of paper, not on tracing paper, on a piece of paper with some, um, I was working on drawing some designs that you could do as the center. So if on yours, you want like a reindeer or a tree or I'll do like a bell I'll do all the classic stuff and if you like that you cut them out of your piece of paper and trace them onto the center of your monk's cloth on your sweater and then you hook it that way and then you decide 
how many stripes you want, how many scallops you want. If, if you want to go to the craft store and pick out bells or sequins or whatever, but you're going to get a lot of bling in um, this afternoon, Kira. Definitely this afternoon because I can I want to ship them right away. So stuff like this, you know, I've shown you this before, this glitter yarn. I, it looks black, but it's every color of the rainbow. It's looking awful on camera, but it's like it's like Christmas lights. It's so bright. Um, I've got some of that. I've got the, the metallic and the silver one up there. Lots and lots of colors. I've got a lot of mohair and like evergreen and um, white. That'll make beautiful snowflakes or a beautiful white mohair sweater with like a giant Santa face on it or something. And you can do stripes, polka dots, whatever. You know, only you know what your ugly sweater should look like. I used these colors in mine. The camera looks awful, but they're super pretty bright pinky colors. Oh, and then these, I'll put in some stuff with these. Uh, these are these felt, uh, foil backed felt sheets. They go, th I, I put them through the Fraser cutter. I have a Fraser cutter, a bliss cutter. Um, and they're all different metallic colors. So I cut them into um, strips and I'll probably give you some colors cut into strips or some larger ones. Cause like for my tree stump, I cut this with scissors a little bit wider to get that tree stump in gold. It hooks really well. There's like no issue at all with the hooking. It hooks really well. So there's some bling here too. So every kit will be different. Every kit will come with tons and tons of bling. So those will be up later today. I also posted this weekend. Weekend Mondays are always big catch-up days, huh? I also posted this weekend uh, some of my mom's great designs. I posted this one of mine. This is one from last year that I did but I tidied it up a bit and tightened it up. So this is available, Candy Manor. Um, everything is available as a kit. Just let me know. I have to figure out, you know, you know, I never price my kits super, super high. I don't have the nerve and I don't want to sort of scalp people, especially at the holidays, but everything is always available as a kit. I can do it. The question becomes, can I do it with yarn? Do I have enough colors of yarn? Because when I get in, I have a lot of colors of wool, but when I get into dyeing, there's only some that I can do as a yarn kit at this moment, as busy as things are. Um, this is my mom's nutcracker that I put like um, a Mackenzie Childs type frame around it in black and white can be any color. And I did the rat king for the nutcracker behind. So this is one of my mom's designs that I pimped out a little bit. This is one of her designs too. The I know, right, Joelle? I want to be sure I have some stuff up for the holidays besides the Nancy Thomas stuff. I love them too. This one, the bunny is available as a yarn kit. I can definitely do that. Um, and then the partridge in a pear tree. There's color suggestions up there, but of course you do whatever you want. These are my mom's designs. Super, super pretty. So that was some of the silliness of the weekend. Just busy. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. So, you know, I got reading my um, Pearl McGowan books and I could not find the one I've had out before. I've got to find it. I had it with me last time I went to the Cape for the weekend. I hope I didn't lose the tote bag there with all my books in it. But I have the other three. There was the designs... Um, the dream behind the design or something, but that's the one I really love. And I wanted to, to go to first. That's her first book, but I have the other three. So I'm going to, I was looking at the other three and I completely went out of order. Um, oh, thanks, Anita. Thanks, Liz. My mom is so good. She's so good. Uh, I went out of order and I took the most recent one to bed the other night and I just, I just love it. I mean, we're going to talk about all of these and it's going to take a lot of time, but the one that's called the the lure and lure of hook drugs by Pearl McGowan. I can put a link to this because they've got it on Amazon too. If you're not an eBay shopper, um, it's a beautiful book. And I thought, let's just get started. Let's look at some of what's in this book because I have some rugs that refer to this book. Um, you know, we, we, we talk so much about the history of rug hooking and Pearl McGowan obviously is a huge part of the history of rug hooking. It matters to me a lot that we also know the other people who are involved in rug hooking, the people who came before, those important names too, uh, the people who came at the same time that uh, were not like as uh, sort of savvy in terms of being business women as Pearl was. She was a super, she was the Claire Murray of the time and, and bigger than Claire Murray in rug hooking, of course. But I mean, in terms of being a business person and creating an industry, it's Pearl, right? I just, I so want to be sure that we know the other names because they're all so important to the whole chronology. Uh, and Pearl is real specific. And I love her designs. And I love the style that they represent, the sort of middle 20th century. Um, you know, the the this book is particularly talking about her teaching days. And she is, are you giving, are you giving us one more blast? No, I think 
Okay, she's back with her sweater on, making a lot of noise with the jingle jangles. Um, this book is a lot about her teaching days and other teachers who she taught, right? Because this is the era of the certification and everybody being certified um, to teach other people. And then what we're getting, and I'm not being judgmental, but then what we're getting is a lot of people who are hooking exactly the same things exactly the same way or pretty close. So this era of rug hooking, uh, in general, things are going to look uh, quite similar because it's um, very, uh, the, the emphasis is on technique and not on creativity. So Pearl was amazing at compiling and cataloging early designs. She was a wizard. She was to be revered. Uh, the amount of work she did and the number of designs that she gathered and uh, concentrated into a catalog that we that now has a shape that we know which designs are which and what names they've got, uh, even where many of them originated. This was her hard work. This was off her own back, running around to antique stores, running to people's houses, figuring out what designs these were. Hey, Justin. Um, so, you know, it's... Um, it's a lot of work. This is more than 50 years of a person's life represented in the word Pearl McGowan, right? Not even talking about her granddaughter, Jane. So this book it has a heavy emphasis on her teaching days and the, teach, and the uh, teachers that she taught. And it is uh, a 1960s book, but the, all the photos in the book look something like this. Um, and again, it's, it is, these are classic Pearl McGowan, uh, heavy borders, scroll borders. They all have beautiful names. They are all completely unique, but, um, this is very different than looking at somebody like, uh, Magdalena Ebby Briner, uh, or the Hutchinsons. This is not primitive. This is very, um, this is almost like a hat tip toward more classic English style carpets, Oriental style carpets. It's a style, right? Pearl McGowan also did a lot of scenes that were very Courier and Ives, uh, pictorial scenes, um, still lifes, uh, animals, lots of different subjects. But this is really what she's synonymous with and what uh, she's known for at this point um, because there's so many of them. There's so many of this style. So this book, this is the only book I'm talking about today, The Lore and Lore. Um, this book talks about... I'm going to read this straight from the book because, of course, I can't read everything. I'm paraphrasing the things that so far I thought were the most interesting. Uh, this book, she says, there are still 157 other designs created previously to the last decade, which have never been illustrated in any of my books. So this was the fourth book. And 29 more new ones created since 1954, not included in this book. So this cliffhanger there too. Some of the old designs never illustrated before they were part of the national annual exhibit. So she's saying a lot of the rugs were seen at exhibits, but for us, that's not helping us. We need this book. And she's showing us page by page, a lot of these early designs. For example, this one, they're in black and white for the most part, is called, uh, it's number 39 and it's called New England Old Fashioned classic Pearl McGowan. And shading is going to be a big part of this, of course, the heavy border. The more you look at her designs, the more you appreciate them because you've got this beautiful feathery scroll. You've got this sort of buried detail coming off of each one. It's very different. It's a very different um, design. They all are once you really start looking. This is the rug that was used in Webster's Dictionary to illustrate hooked rugs. So, you know, Webster's has uh, pictures that illustrate a lot of the words it's defining. This is the picture. The New England Old Fashioned is the picture for a hooked rug. So that's just kind of an interesting piece of trivia. Um, I went through and I looked at some of the rugs and she says such interesting things about them. She was so deep into cataloging hooked rugs, um, designing hooked rugs, um, uh, teaching teachers at the end. She didn't do a lot of hooking because she was so busy traveling and teaching, searching, cataloging. She did a lot of academic work with the rugs. So this one is in her language because she, this is her life. She has she evolved her own language for design elements um, that really we should pick up again. For example, in this design that is called number one uh, number seven hundred and fourteen, patrician the patrician, as in like the upper class person. Um, she says it has many interesting features, including a picket fence border. I've never heard of a picket fence border, but it occurred to me 
to check. And in this book, there are lots of references to the names of borders and flowers and the placement or the position of things uh, that she gives a special name to, which has kind of fallen by the wayside. I think we should lock into those things and start using them again, because using descriptive words when we talk about rug cooking as much as we do is important. This is the patrician with its picket fence border. I mean, that's really something, isn't it? I don't know if I, if I would call that a picket fence border. I might call it like rickrack or something, but I love that she did. And now when I see a border like that, you can be sure that I'm gonna refer to it as a picket fence border. Just look at this composition, right? It really goes like this, cause you see the way the flowers are weighted down, um, sort of like bleeding hearts kind of thing. I always forget what these kinds of flowers are called. Somebody help me out. Like obviously some kind of a bell. I don't know if that's a blue bell, but we don't have the colors. Um, but as I went through, I was just blown away by the detail. Even stuff like this. Have you seen this Promagown rug, Snowflakes? I mean, that, to me, that was a bit uh, different. It was really different. It's definitely not my favorite, but it just shows uh, variety and a wide sort of scope. Now, she talks about other things in this book. She goes page by page looking at these early rugs and telling you what the names of them are. And if you're a quilter, you might be the kind of a quilter like, like I used to be who loved to go through books of quilting patterns and try to memorize them like it was Braille, like it was the Rosetta Stone, like it was another language because it was so interesting to look at something and, and it was like a feather in your cap to be able to say, you know what that is? That is a mm -mm block. And to be able to do that with rug hooking patterns too, I think is just amazing because there are thousands. Um, but looking at these pearl books is going to give you a good start. I know I'm running short on time already. But one of these chapters, she takes a break from the sort of catalog and talking about each rug in great detail, telling you exactly what colors the person used to hook the rug, not recipe, but just, you know, this much spice, a lot of spice, a little bit of this, a little bit of uh, bronze green. And you get a, without having the color in the book, you get a real picture for what they were going for. Um, and then she's got this chapter that really sticks out that's called Necessity is the Mother of Invention. And this is how she starts the chapter out. Husbands deserve a great amount of credit for many improvements in ruggers' equipment. They watch their wives struggling with inefficient tools and set their initiative, uh, sorry, inventive minds to work to make improvements. This makes us think of Edward Sands Frost, right? How he would sit and watch his wife struggling um, with the design part of the pattern and getting things even and symmetrical. And then he just went out in the shed and took the tin that he already had there and started banging out stencils and became majorly successful um, commercial printer and, and entrepreneur in row cooking. But there are a lot of guys who did this. Apparently husbands are important. Um, Lester H. Gibbs, now deceased of Clinton, Mass, in 1930 made the earliest improvement on the old fashioned hook by replacing the thick shank and the deep sharp point with a slender, and you can picture that, like those old, old hooks have a really thick point because they were probably made from cutlery and a really, really sharp end to them. So that when you're pushing it through every time when your finger touches it uh, to make contact with your strip, it hurts a little bit and it hurts more the second time and it really hurts the hundredth time. So when you get into the tens of thousands of time, you know, you'd need things like this, a uh, bit weird bandages on every callus and every cut you've got on your fingers. So he created a more modified hook um, by replacing the thick shank and the sharp point with a slender shank and uh, low and a low hook that would not open the mesh of the burlap too far, but would easily release uh, the loop of material. So fiddly, but he figured out the sort of science of uh, a more sensible hook, probably easier to push through too. The McGowan hook is fashioned in the same manner. So she kind of fashioned the hook that she, if not invented, then uh, okayed based on Lester Gibbs hook from 1930. The Bliss Machine, uh, which also had interchangeable blades, well, she talks about him also, same guy, Lester, watching his wife, Elva, um, Lester and Elva. You hardly get couples with those names anymore, do you? Do you know any uh, any couple named Lester and Elva? It's like super um, mid-20th century names, right? It's it's kind of, it's kind of cute. Um, I'm not being belittling. It's just unusual. So Elva's cutting her strips one at a time with a pair of scissors that constantly need to be sharpened. And he sees that this is not the most time efficient uh, or fun way to pursue a hobby. So he also invents a cutting machine, these super resourceful people, right? A cutting machine that would slit a piece of material into many narrow strips at one time with uh, interchangeable blades. And these machines were manufactured by Mr. Gibbs for many years. 
and are still being made uh, in Dover, New Hampshire. Remember, this book is from, I think, 1963. The machine is clamped on the side of an edge or a table. And similarly, in 1945, the Bliss machine with interchangeable bla blades was developed by Harvey Bliss. Same sort of scenario in Manchester, Connecticut, near me here. Uh, it, it acquired its patent in 1948. And uh, of course, we still use the Bliss. I have a Bliss and I use it all the time and it works great with the interchangeable blades that can be sharpened. But in this chapter, she talks about, I'm gonna break in a sec, but she talks about uh, different things that husbands noticed in watching their wives uh, that they improved upon in terms of the tools that we use to, to hook rugs. One of them is the frame. And she says in 1930, uh, when the rug hooking revival really started, the tilting easel floor frames um, were made by different carpenters, like you could have it made locally, but some husbands began making their own um, frames uh, out of like nicer wood, like mahogany and brass fixtures, like really fancy special ones. I would love to find one of these just to keep with um, brass fixtures and ras ratchets and rollers that locked into place like a Chetty Camp style frame, um, something that could go right into the living room and right along the couch. And one husband said, if it's going to be in the living room, it might as well look as if it belonged there, which is a really good point. Um, and then she says, we learned to use lap frames during World War II when we found it difficult to travel with the larger frames. And at that point, husbands were making very small lap frames like Heather, like yours did um, last week and using thumbtacks to hold the thing in place. And it was actually a woman who ended up using the carpet strips that we use now with the sort of the strips with all the needles on it in response to the problem of the thumbtacks popping off and things not staying really taut. Marjorie Thomas, sorry, Marjorie Thompson of Rockport, Mass, one of my favorite towns, invented a small lap frame with thousands of fine steel bristles on all four sides so that the burlap could be stretched taut while you hook. Did you know that it was a woman that invented that? Isn't that funny? It sounds like the best invention out of all of these, and it's nice that it was a woman. But this whole chapter is about um, husbands. And it's, you know, it's just kind of funny because um, she, when she's talking, I'm going to stop in one minute. When she's talking about the lap frame, she, uh, Pearl puts it into context by saying that um, with this handy frame, every five or 10 minutes, you know, a woman can get up when another family member calls or when they're baking something, they can get up and like retrieve what they've been baking. Um, and I just thought, you know, I'm not a feminist by any means, but I thought that was a kind of funny spin on it. It reminded me of um, uh, a class I took in college. I guess I got into a woman's studies class or something like that. And somebody brought up one of these episodes of one of these shows like Remington Steel, but I think it was like um, Heart and Heart or something with the two women detectives and how there was a scene where a policeman on a cruise ship where there was a murder said to um, said something about the crime or a, a suspicion and the female heart detective said something that was even more intelligent. And then the script moved to her saying that the porthole in the boat uh, reminded her of the motion of a washing machine, like a clothing washing machine. And the point is, and the point was, uh, that at that period, 60s, right, when, the, when this book is written, 70s, even 80s, um, it's really important for women to constantly be reminding, again, I'm not being a sexist, but men, uh, that they are still domestic and are not intimidating and are not going to take over the world. You've got to remind a man that while you're inventing a frame that you still remember about your baking in the oven or about what a washing machine looks like. It's just it's just the way life is, right? It goes back to what we were talking about last week with women who ended up hooking instead of painting because it was easy to get up and down with all the children running around your legs. The story of life. But let's go back to Pearl tomorrow because we're going to have a regular episode tomorrow. I want to look a lot more at this book. Oh, God, I didn't even get to show you these rugs. I've got some beauties here to show you that are in the book uh, that are mostly finished. Let's come back to Pearl tomorrow. We'll come to Pearl tomorrow. On Wednesday, we'll have our Zoom call. So look for that or send me an email at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. Uh, let me know and I'll send you the Zoom information. The only reason I'm being a gatekeeper at all which you know I don't like to do is because I'm afraid there's going to be like boobs and scammers and porn people and whatever, like logging on if we're not careful about having sort of some discretion about giving the Zoom information out. So um, ribboncantyhooking at gmail.com or look at rug, hook, uh, rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club on Facebook because it'll be right there starting in five minutes. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Let's come back to Pearl tomorrow because she, she is a pearl, isn't she? I've got to say it. No boobs allowed, right? We have plenty of those in coffee time. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great afternoon.